words in the song says when I walk through the valley I will not be afraid because God is my strength and my shield when things around me is all shaken up I will not be shaken if the Lord is my strength and my shield I will not be shaken My lamp burning, turn the darkness to light. Set my feet high on the mountain. My enemies to fight, so I will praise you as long as I live. And I, I will praise you again and again. around us seems to be on the rise that's what the news is telling us and uh, we have this tendency to panic and our panic shows how much we trust the Lord so let's trust the Lord take him at his word the scripture teaches us that the one who builds his house on the rock it's like the person who listens to the words of Jesus and obeys it. And when the storms come and the rain hits, the house on the rock stood firm. So let us as obedient people, as obedient children, learn to trust in the Lord. Throughout when problems around us keep rising, let us still keep trusting the Lord. And mercy and grace with your banner of love over me. I am longing to see you one day face to face and to be with you endlessly. Lord, how lovely you are to me. Lovely Lovely, 
study the scriptures help us to see more and more of Jesus and to know how lovely it is to have this relationship with with him he does not put conditions he does not condemn us but he has saved us through and through and day after day he speaks to us like a loving shepherd he guides us and he builds us up and throughout this time of struggle a god is an ever present help and we have to just lift up our eyes to you o lord and you are by our side you are with us and everything that we are going through o lord you understand because you have gone through this and you lived as a human among us you have experienced our pain our struggles our loss our temptations nothing is hidden from you nothing is strange to you you have been tempted in every way but you are victorious and father help us to find our hope and our strength in you alone during this time We trust you, O Lord, and we take you at your word. Speak to us this evening, cleanse us afresh, and strengthen us through your word. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Okay. Right. So, welcome to everyone who have joined us on this Sunday evening. On Sundays, we are focusing on the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John. So keep your diaries open, pens ready, and your Bible open to John chapter one. John chapter one. And the last few weeks, we have been looking at John chapter one, and in John chapter one, we have been focusing on the titles of Jesus. 
the seven titles that John mentions, the writer John mentions about Jesus in this chapter. And we saw the word, Jesus is the word of God. Second, we saw Jesus is the light that shines out in the darkness. Jesus is the son of God. We saw it last week. And today we are going to see two titles. One is the Lamb of God and two, the Messiah. The Lamb of God and the Messiah. And then next week, we are going to focus on the King of Israel and the Son of Man. The King of Israel and the Son of Man. Okay, The seven titles of Jesus that you would find in chapter 1 of John. The Word of God, the Light, the Son of God, the Lamb, the Messiah, the King of Israel and the Son of Man. Today's passage is taken from John chapter 1 verse 29 to 34. 29 to 34. And that is the Lamb of God. And the Messiah is taken from verse 35 to 42. 35 to 42. Okay. So 29 to 34 is the Lamb of God and 35 to 42 is the Messiah. And when Last week, you know, I was asking a few young students about how much they know about John the Baptist. And people know a lot because of Sunday school, thank God for Sunday schools. People know about who John the Baptist is and his weird dressing and his weird, you know, way of lifestyle in the wilderness. All those things children are aware of. And one of the things that we admire about John the Baptist is he was a radical. He lived his life, served the Lord through and through. A special child when he was born to a barren couple, Elizabeth and Zechariah, both from the priestly family. And in their old age, God promises them that their prayer is going to be answered. And here comes John. And this is a child of promise because God at first, it's before the child is conceived itself, when the promise of the child is given, then itself God tells them about what a great child John would be. And of course, we know that you know, John grew up to be as great as God had promised. He was the messenger who was supposed to go in front and declare that the Messiah is on the way. So, John's ministry was special. His message was also very weird. What was his weird message? He was preaching to the Jews. By birth, they were Jews. He was preaching to the Jews to become real Jews. You know, to become Jews of promise. Not Jews by tradition. Not Jews by birth. Claiming ancestry, you know, Abraham as their ancestor. No, that's not the Jew. The so children of the promise are the real Jews. So they had to repent and come into a relationship with God by coming to the waters of baptism at Jordan. So the word that John preaches is very, very important. The message of John of repentance is very, very important. But last week we saw that he was also a witness who declared who Jesus is. And that's what we're going to see today. Verse 29 onwards. The next day he saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. I myself did not know him. But for this purpose I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness. I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. Okay. So here is John the Baptist declaring, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The verse starts with the next day. If you notice the beginning, you'll see that it happens the next day. Next day in connection with which one? With the day before that. When a council came to interrogate John the Baptist. 
അതിനെ ക്വസ്റ്റ്യൻ ചെയ്യാൻ വേണ്ടി ഒരു ഗ്രൂപ്പ് ഓഫ് ആൾക്കാർ വന്നു ആർ യു ദ മെസ്സായ ആർ യു ദ പ്രോഫറ്റ് എന്നൊക്കെ അദ്ദേഹത്തോട് കുറെ ചോദ്യങ്ങളൊക്കെ ചോദിച്ചു അപ്പൊ ആ ദിവസത്തിന് ശേഷമുള്ള ദിവസം ദ നെക്സ്റ്റ് ഡേ വി സോ ദാറ്റ് ദീസ് ഡേയ്സ് ആർ എ പാരല ഓഫ് ജെനസസ് യുനോ ഫസ്റ്റ് ചാപ്റ്റർ വെർ ദ ഡേയ്സ് ആർ യുനോ സന്ധ്യായ ഉഷസ്സുമായ ഒന്നാം ദിവസം രണ്ടാം ദിവസം അങ്ങനെ പറയുന്നത് പോലെ സെവൻ ഡേയ്സ് ഓഫ് ജെനസിന് പാരല ആയിട്ട് ദ ന്യൂ ക്രിയേഷൻ ഇസ് ബീങ് ഹൈലൈറ്റഡ് ബൈ ജോൺ ഓക്കെ സോ വി ഫൈൻഡ് ദാറ്റ് ഹിയർ ഇസ് ജോൺ സെയിങ് അബൌട്ട് ദ സെക്കൻഡ് ഡേ സോ വാട്ട് ഇസ് ഹാപ്പനിങ് ഓൺ ദ സെക്കൻഡ് ഡേ ദ സെക്കൻഡ് ഡേ ഓഫ് ദ വീക്ക് ദിസ് ടൈം ജോൺ ദ ബാപ്റ്റിസ്റ്റ് ഇസ് ഡിക്ലെയറിങ് ദ ടൈറ്റിൽ ഫോർ ജീസസ് നോട്ട് ദ ടൈറ്റിൽ ദ ലാമ്പ് ഓഫ് ഗോഡ് ഇറ്റ് ഡസ് നോട്ട് ജസ്റ്റ് സേ ഇറ്റ് വൺസ് he says it again in verse 36 and he looked at jesus as he walked by and said behold the lamb of god so he is declaring this title of jesus now what is this title of jesus the lamb of god see the whole message of the bible can be summed up in this title okay the whole message of the bible can be summed up in this title if you look at genesis chapter 22 and verse 7 Genesis chapter 22 and verse 7 Here we find Abraham going to offer Isaac as a sacrifice and as they are going towards the mountain the question is asked by Isaac a very important question Isaac said to his father Abraham my father and he said here I am my son he said behold the fire and the wood but where is the lamb for a burnt offering the whole of the old testament ask this question where is the lamb where is the lamb because without the lamb there is no salvation there is no redemption you see so the whole of the old testament asks the question it looks forward to the lamb of god where is the lamb that is a question that is asked in the old testament and we see that the four gospels emphasize this point here is the lamb or behold the lamb here he is he has come you have asked the question and here is god's answer behold the lamb and once you have trusted in this lamb once you have ac- accepted this once you have acknowledged that he is the lamb of god once you have believed it in your heart and once you have a relationship with this lamb of god and then what happens Revelation chapter 5 verse 12 Revelation chapter 5 and verse 12 we join the heavenly choirs you know the people who sing out in heaven we join that that group and from here itself we start singing worthy is the lamb worthy is the lamb so throughout heaven that will be our hymn that will be our anthem that will be our song we will be declaring worthy is the lamb worthy is the lamb so the old testament is the question about where is the lamb and the new testament emphasizes the fact the gospels emphasize the fact behold the lamb here is the lamb once you have trusted in him and you have a relationship with him you have already joined the choirs of heaven in starting to declare worthy is the lamb worthy is the lamb worthy is the lamb so the whole of the word of god whole of the, uh, the new testament and the old testament combined can be summed up in this one message behold the lamb here is the lamb the lamb of god now the people of israel are not strangers to the lamb you know the lambs for sacrifice are a common sight in israel there were specialists who were supplying lambs without blemish to the temple it was a big industry there a lot of shady dealings would go on inside the temple for the lambs but definitely every passover each family has to bring a lamb for sacrifice it is based on exodus chapter 12 verses 1 to 13 I'm not going to read it you can read it as homework exodus chapter 12 verses 1 to 13 how moses was given the instruction about the first passover and how the lamb had to be killed and how the blood had to be put you know on the on the door posts but turn with me to isaiah chapter 53 isaiah 53 
and verse 7. Isaiah 53 verse 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers are silent, so he opened not his mouth. Okay. So here is the Old Testament picture of the Lamb of God. One that is chosen for sacrifice at the altar. And twice in a year for the nation, lambs would be sacrificed by the high priest. Twice, two lambs. No, every day two lambs would be sacrificed. At the temple altar, the lambs would be sacrificed for personal sacrifices. So lambs for sacrifice are a common sight throughout of Israel. Now, the difference is, these lambs were brought by people for the people. Okay. People would buy it for themselves, for their own sacrifices. It was their lamb for their own sins. But here is God's lamb. It was given by God to humans. Okay. So this lamb was different from all the lambs of the Old Testament. Those lambs of the Old Testament were brought by the people for the people. But here is God bringing forth his lamb for mankind. Those lambs were only for Israel because God had a covenant relationship with Israel. But these, this lamb of God, Jesus Christ, he is going to be sacrificed for the whole world. That is the difference. So the lamb of God in the Old Testament, the lambs of, of the people, they are not the lambs of God. They are the lambs of the people for the people, but prescribed by God and they would bring their lambs. But here is God bringing his lamb for all of mankind. It is not just for Israel, it is for the whole world. So, is he special? Yes, this is the fulfillment of all the pictures of the Old Testament. All the pictures of the lambs being sacrificed in the Old Testament. The, the reality is Jesus being sacrificed on the cross. Now what does John's baptism have to do with Jesus as the Lamb of God. When Jesus comes to the waters of baptism, John says, hey, I have to be baptized by you. Suddenly realization comes. You know, John was getting his revelations directly from above. Just like the prophets of the Old Testament, he was getting his revelation from God directly. So this revelation about who Jesus is also was given to him by God himself. Immediately John said, hey, I should be baptized by you. Not the other way around. And Jesus said, let it be. Why? Because he says this very important statement. Matthew chapter 3 and verse 15. Matthew chapter 3 and verse 15. Let it be so now, for thus is it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. But Jesus answered him, let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. What does it mean? What does Jesus say when he says that? See, the, the baptism is actually a picture of death, burial and resurrection. Why? Because baptism means immersion. You see? What does this immersion suggest? It is suggesting a person dying, buried. And rising up as a new creation. Rising as with a new start. So, when the baptism was given by John, Jesus came there. And he says, let all righteousness be fulfilled. So, when John baptized Jesus, Jesus and John were actually picturing the baptism that Jesus was going to endure on the cross. When he would die as the lamb for the as a sacrifice for all mankind. So when Jesus would die on that cross, that would be his real baptism. And this was only a picture of that. So when is all righteousness being fulfilled? All righteousness is going to be fulfilled when in the death 
and resurrection of death, burial and resurrection of the Lamb of God. You see. So on the cross only everything was going to be fulfilled. When he dies and he is buried and he rises up. So here is a picture of what is going to happen on the cross being played out in the beginning itself. Beginning of his ministry when Jesus is baptized by John. Turn with me to the book of Isaiah again. Isaiah 53 and verse 7. Isaiah 53 and verse 7. A picture of what happened on the cross, right? He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that is before its shearer, silent, so he opened not his mouth. So this is Jesus' real baptism. When he is going to die, he is going to be buried, he is going to be resurrected at the cross. Turn with me to Luke chapter 12 and verse 50. Luke chapter 12 and verse 50. I have a baptism to be baptized with. And how great is my distress until it is accomplished. Which baptism is he talking about here? He's talking about his death on the cross. So, through his death, through his burial, and through his resurrection, Jesus was going to fulfill all righteousness. Now, before this point, did John know that Jesus was the person? You know, when you read Luke's uh, Gospel, chapter 1 and 2, you will understand that um, Mary and Elizabeth are related. And Mary knew about Elizabeth, though barren, now was, has conceived and she is having a child who is six months old. When Mary gets the news of Jesus, Elizabeth is already carrying the baby who is six months old in, in her womb. So Mary goes to spend some time with Elizabeth and to encourage and help her. And when she reaches there, the baby jumps in Elizabeth's womb. It's not yet a baby. No. It is just growing in her womb and that baby jumps in her womb giving an indication about recognition. Okay. And many times Elizabeth, Elizabeth also recognized who, whom Mary is carrying in her womb and there is a song of praise from Elizabeth and there is a song of praise from Mary and we understand that Mary and Elizabeth have discussed this. So Elizabeth is aware of this. And she would have, I'm sure, told John many times that Mary's son is special. She would have told him that Mary's son is the Messiah. They would have discussed this. But John says, come with me to verse 31 of John chapter 1 verse 31. I myself did not know him. I myself did not know him. So, here is John admitting the fact that he did not know. You know. Then how did he know? Verse 32, And John bore witness, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove and it remained on him. I myself did not know him. He says it again. But he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and I have borne witness that this is the Son of God. So he admits to the fact that he did not recognize him. Though he was my own relative, I did not know him. I did not know him. The same phrase that is used you know, earlier in the chapter, uh, I think it is um, uh, verse 10, John chapter 1 verse 10. He was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. You see, that same Greek phrase is used here again. The world did not know him. The world was ignorant about him. The world had no clue about him. John had no clue about him. Kochinar so, Lengla Kualan Samayat, we had this um, you know, Balerama magazine, you know, children's magazine. It used to come every every month, two magazines we used to get. And we used to wait for these magazines to come. But in between, they have this uh, small, small activities, you know, coloring page and all that. But there is one particular stuff where you get a lot of dots, okay? A lot of dots where they'll say like, you know, uh, dots in a 
chala numbers unda and so many numbers have to be colored with a specific color and the other dots have to be colored with a definite shade you know another color another shade and when you color it something will emerge from that picture okay. depending on how well you color it and shade it some some image is hidden inside that picture and that hidden picture will be revealed namm ingane shade cheythu varumbodhe namm kaana oh aane aaru aana adinathu olippichu vechirikkaru and you shade it and you shade it and suddenly the elephant bleeds just pops out and you say oh there was an elephant so we like doing all this activities the same way this just popped out from nowhere for john the baptist he said i didn't know i couldn't recognize him because why because jesus lived an ordinary life there was no indication that jesus was the messiah he did not look extremely handsome like a cinema star he did not have you know uh, goldy locks like kaana in the pratyekata blond color hair onnu undayirunnilla he did not have a golden robe just to differentiate the lamb of god he did not have a halo around his head there was no indication that jesus was different that's what john says enik aa kuttukala yojipikkanayittu sadhichilla when i was growing up i i myself did not know him so he's he's admitting so for a, a prophet of god to admit that he didn't know certain things john was very humble in that way see john was very honest to speak the truth he spoke about his ignorance he spoke i did not know that much. so just because john had to be sure so that john would not make a mistake god gave him a sign and what was the sign the sign was but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me he on whom you see the spirit descend and remain this is he who baptized with the holy spirit and i have seen and borne witness see so john wasn't sure so god the father made it clear to john by sending the holy spirit like a dove then of course the other passages say about an audible voice just in case you missed that also john here is my beloved son in him i am well placed and a beautiful picture of how the trinity works is shown there and john had no doubt he declared it behold the lamb of god who takes away the sin of the world now we come to the second title the messiah now the next day again so it's a third day in sequence okay so the seventh day would be including chapter 2 verse 1 to 12 that means the wedding at cana is the seventh day okay so third day is in a sequence and the two disciples who are following jesus following uh, john you'll see that john was standing with two of his disciples and he looked at jesus as he walked by and said behold the lamb of god the two disciples heard him say this and they followed jesus jesus turned and saw them following and said to him what are you seeking they said to him rabbi which means teacher where are you staying john was glad when his disciples followed jesus john was glad you know he says in chapter 3 was 30 chapter 3 was 30 he says um do sorry he must increase but i must decrease i have come focusing on jesus my ministry is focused on jesus my life is focused on jesus so as jesus increases i am rejoicing his followers number of his followers increase i am rejoicing my followers are decreasing praise god because they are now following jesus so john was a very special character you see he was an extraordinary man but his ignorance about jesus's earlier life it tells us that he was ordinary he was he was only human you see an extraordinary man who was also a human he claimed that he was only the voice he was not the word so john claimed that he was the messenger and not the message to all his followers to all his admirers he would have said hey man i am not the one i am not the one that all spotlights go on jesus okay. i am the voice not the word 
So John was extraordinary, but he was only a human. John was the messenger. He was not the message. Who was the message? The message was Jesus. He spoke about Jesus. His focus was on Jesus. But John was not the savior. He was not the mess message. He was only the messenger. John was useful to God. But he was not indispensable to God. What does indispensable mean? Some people, you know, they have these success stories. After they have been preaching for a long time, they've been having ministries in their names and suddenly they become indispensable. Which means the moment the leader either retires or falls, the whole ministry collapses. Why? Because the leader was indispensable. And in, in Christendom, in God's kingdom, there is no human being who is indispensable. Only Jesus is indispensable. We are all useful in God's hands as instruments but none of us are indispensable john's life was a success story you know people came from far and wide and they got baptized by john but john knew that his time was almost over and jesus's time had now come he was willing to lay down his life for whose sake for the sake of christ for what he believed he stood up and he boldly proclaimed so he was useful in god's hands but he was not indispensable. None of our ministers, none of our preachers, none of the so-called prophets today are indispensable. Everyone is uh, you know, useful in God's hands, but at one point, God can remove them if he wants to. So let's not be admirers of, of saints, you know, uh, admirers of other people, saying, oh, great preacher, and you know, we follow him rather than we follow Jesus. We stop reading the word of God and only listen to messages. That is a dangerous attitude. And we put them on a pedestal and we would never allow them to come down from that pedestal. There is only one Jesus. The rest are all instruments in his hands. So let's not glorify the instrument. We are useful in God's hands, but we are not indispensable. And finally, John teaches us that he was an effective leader. He was an effective leader. He did great things for Jesus. He did exactly as God wanted him to do. So that is effectiveness. People repented. They came to him for baptism. And John gave them baptism. Then John gave them the word of God. And he also confronted Herod. And he did all the things according to what God wanted him to do. He prepared the way for Jesus. He, he proclaimed to them that he is the Lamb of God. He did everything exactly as God wanted him to do. But he remained humble. We see his humility in this verse. John chapter 3 verse 30. He says, He shall increase and I should decrease. Let Jesus increase. Let his followers increase. Let all my followers follow Jesus. I don't care. Why? Because he must increase. That is why I have come. See? So, we see the next day, John declares again and he is in danger of losing his followers. Two of his disciples immediately start following Jesus. Who are these two disciples? We know one is Andrew. The other most probably has to be John, the writer of this gospel. Okay, So John and Andrew, they were followers of John the Baptist. And when John pointed them to the Messiah, to the Lamb of God, they had to go and follow Jesus. So John and Andrew would have been friends. Why? Because they are both fishermen. Um, Andrew and Peter were close friends and partners in the business of fishing. Zebedee's sons, John and James. So we see that, you know, they are very close to each other. And John and Andrew um, followed Jesus. Now, Jesus asked them a very pointed question. What is that? What are you seeking? So people follow Jesus with a lot of motives. But the question we have to ask ourselves is, what are you seeking? What am I seeking? By following Christ, what do I want? Do I want a comfortable life? Do I want a cushy life? Do I want entertainment? Do I want good music? Do I want a lively church? People come with different motives to Christ. But the question that Jesus asks is very, very straightforward. What are you seeking? What are you seeking from me? You're following me, but answer this question. What are you seeking? See, in those days, young men 
used to follow rabbis for two reasons. One, to learn the word of God, to study the word of God. And two, was whether that person was a radical who would lead a revolution against Rome. So they are the people who attract a lot of young people. They call them zealots. Z-E-A-L-O-T-S. Zealots. They are the people who would lead rebellions against Rome. Armed rebellions. Guerrilla warfare. You know, they would hide on top of the mountains or on the rocks and they would throw down rocks on the Roman soldiers and kill them and make a you know, life hell for the emperor and his troops. They were the zealots. They were trying to liberate Israel. They were trying to free Jerusalem. They said, we want you know, uh, uh, to bring Israel back to the glory days. David's reign like that. We want to bring back the glory days. And they were the zealots. Willing to die for the nation. Patriotic fellows. So young people would go and follow them. And Jesus asked asking this question. Are you following me because you think that I am a radical? I am a zealot? If you want to free Israel from the Romans, better go and join some group, which is a zealot group. Because I am not that kind of a leader. That's why he wanted to make that clear to them. They had to ask themselves, what are they seeking? Today we have to ask the same question. Okay. What am I seeking from Christ? Now, what did they reply? They said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? You know, they thought Jesus would have been busy. So they said, okay, so when you finish everything, when you come home, we will come and visit you at your home and we'll talk there. Where are you staying? And he said, come, you will see. Don't wait for the evening. You come and join me now. It's, you know, this is morning. And Jesus told them to follow. Why? Because on the journey, he would have been talking to them. On the journey, they would have seen all that Jesus spoke and Jesus did. So they started following Jesus. They would ask all their doubts to Jesus. And Jesus would have cleared that doubts also. So their relationship started then and there when Jesus said, Come and you will see. Come. So to us also who seeks after the Lord, to seek after him, the Lord says the same thing. So come and you will see. Nobody comes to him and immediately, you know, sees. But over a period of time, our eyes will be opened more and more and we'll see more of Christ. And then we will truly see. Our blind eyes will be opened and we would see who Christ really is. No? They did not know, have a full revelation of Christ at that time. But they knew that he was somebody different. They knew that he was special because the way Andrew goes and calls Peter tells us what they thought about Jesus. They came and saw where he was staying and they stayed with him that day for it was about the 10th hour. One of the two who heard John speak and follow Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him. See? So, where is your dwelling? And Jesus said, come and you will see. And they came and dwelt with Jesus. And Andrew got up in the morning and the first thing that he had to do was go find his brother. See, in Genesis, God asked this question. Genesis chapter 4 and verse 9. God asked this question to one brother. And asked him, where is your brother? The brother was Cain. He said, where is your brother Abel? And Cain replies to God and says, am I my brother's keeper? But Andrew, if you ask the same question, Andrew would say, yes, I am my brother's keeper. I'm concerned about, about Simon's salvation. I'm concerned that Simon should see what I have seen. He could not sit idle. He went and caught Simon. And what does he say? We have found the Messiah. He was bringing his brother to Jesus. See, Andrew is a very good picture in the New Testament of people bringing people to Jesus. Andrew was always bringing someone to, to Jesus. We see here, Andrew bringing his brother, Simon. And then later on, we'll see in chapter 6, verse 8 and 9, he brings that boy with the bread and the fish to Jesus. He says, here is a boy, 5,000 mouths to feed, 5,000 plus mouths to feed. It's a difficult task. But here he brings a boy with a few loaves of bread and fish. It says, Jesus, 
can you do something with this? So he's bringing the boy with the food to Jesus. And then we see him bringing a group of Greeks who wanted to come and meet Jesus. Chapter 12 of John, verse 20 and 21. We see them, they were Greek speaking people. And they wanted to come and uh, you know, meet Jesus. So they came to the only Greek name that is there in the, among the disciples, Philip. And Philip took them to Andrew. And Andrew took them to Jesus. You see, always bringing people to Jesus. One of the great soul winners in the Bible, Andrew. And he says, we have found the Messiah. We have been focusing on the Messiah in the other classes. So I'll just explain it in this class also. What does the Messiah mean? The Messiah is a Hebrew word, which actually means the anointed one. In Greek, it is called Christ. The Messiah in Hebrew, Christ in Greek. What it means is the anointed one. Now, what does anointing mean? Anointing means application of oil, rubbing. That's all that I uh, know. Uh, that's all that uh, anointing means. So, but in the Old Testament, this was prescribed for three groups of people: prophets, priests, and kings. Mainly, priests and kings, because they have to serve God and to serve people. The anointing was put on their heads so that they would be called up. They would be special. The application of the oil was outward. But the implication was inwardly the Holy Spirit has started his work in these people. Okay, I'll say it again. The, the application of the oil is on the hair, on the head, outside. But the implication, the meaning of it is inside a change has started to take place. The Holy Spirit has started to work in this person's life to make him the leader fit to serve God and able to serve man. This is the purpose of anointing. Anointing is nothing special because it's on the outward. But the inward activity of the Holy Spirit is what is important. That is what changes the person to become the priest that God wants him to be. To become the prophet that God wants to be. And to become the, the king that God wants him to be. So, when they call him the anointed one, what does the Jew mean? Turn with me to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26, verse 63 and 64. When Jesus is being questioned, this is one of the questions. Verse 63 and 64. But Jesus remained silent and the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Are you the Messiah? Which means the Son of God. And Jesus says to him, you have said so. Which means that is correct. You have said the truth. I tell you from now on you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Let's check the other Gospels what it says. Mark chapter 14, the same passage. Okay? Mark chapter 14 and verse 61 and 62. Mark chapter 14 verse 61 and 62. But he remained silent and made no answer. Again the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. The high priest tore his garments. You see? Let's check one more gospel. Luke's gospel chapter 22, verse 67 onwards. 67 to 70. 22 verses 67 to 70. And if you are the Christ, tell us. But he said to them, if I tell you, you will not believe. And if I ask you, you will not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man shall be seated at the right hand of the power of God. So they all said, Are you the Son of God then? And he said to them, You say that I am. Then they said, What further testimony do we need? We have heard it ourselves from its lips. So to the Jew, the anointed one is equal to the Son of God. Jesus is openly declaring to them that I am God. I am the Son of God. See? So, there was no confusion with the Jew. He knew exactly why he was killing Jesus. The high priest, he had no confusion. Because Jesus claimed to be equal with God. Because Jesus claimed to be the anointed one. That is why he was crucified. Okay. So, 
But their problem was, they did not have a confusion on what he said. They had a confusion on what he would do. They knew that the, the Messiah would come, the anointed one would come, and he would set them free from the captivity, and he would establish his kingdom. But how was he going to do that? That these people were not sure. Because when they looked at Jesus, they saw an ordinary preacher. They did not see he had any power to overthrow the Roman Empire. So how can he be the Christ? He can't be the Christ. So there was so much confusion on what he would do. So, Jesus had to explain to the, especially his followers, he had to explain to them about the cross before the crown. You see, Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24, you will find the cross before the crown. On the road to Amos, when Jesus is explaining all this to those disciples, he tells them that this must happen. Verse 25, and he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken, was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? See, before the glory, there was suffering. Before the crown, there was the cross. They were ignorant of that fact, you see. And Jesus had to teach them. Repeatedly he was teaching his disciples. This is the plan of God. This is the plan. This is how I'm going to do it. The anointed one has to first suffer. Then only there will be glory. So throughout the gospel you would find the most crucial question the Jews were asking among themselves is, is he really the Messiah? Is he really the one? Andrew said that he is. But the others never believed it. I don't know to what point Andrew also believed it. But there was this confusion. All through Jesus' life here on earth, there was this confusion. Whether Jesus was really the Messiah. So, so every Jew's decision on that particular question, that was very, very crucial. So, turn with me to John chapter 7. John chapter 7 and verse 44. John chapter 7 verse 44. Some of them wanted to arrest him, but no one laid hands on him. Why? Confusion, you see. Confusion. John chapter 7 verse 40 down. Okay? When they heard these words, some of the people said, this really is the prophet. Others said, this is the Christ. But some said, is the Christ to come from Galilee? Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the offspring of David and comes from Bethlehem, the village where David was? So there was a division among the people over him. Some of them wanted to arrest him. See, There was so much confusion about Jesus, whether he was the Christ or not, whether he was the anointed one or not. John chapter 7 verse 20. The crowd answered, you have a demon who is seeking to kill you. Jesus answered him, I did not work. See, they were confused whether he was really having the Holy Spirit upon him or whether he was having a demon upon him. See, the Messiah would not have a demon upon him. Verse 26. John chapter 7 verse 26. And here he is speaking openly and they say nothing to him. Can it be that the authorities really know that this is the Christ? No. Do the scribes know? Do the Pharisees know? Do the high, does the high priest know that he is the Christ already? That's what people are saying about them, about him. You see. Chapter 9, verse 22. Chapter 9, John chapter 9, verse 22. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be the Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, he is of age, ask him. The blind man's parents. John chapter 10, verse 24. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. And Jesus answered and told them, I told you, and you do not believe me. You see? Through his actions and through his words, Jesus was proving it to them that he was the Christ. Yet there was so much confusion. See? But Andrew was very sure. He brought his brother saying that we have found the Messiah. See, Peter had this meeting with Jesus. And he did not know that this meeting was going to change Peter forever. At first, it changed his name. But then, this meeting changed his life. What is the name? He says, 
he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas. Okay, I'll stop with this. What does Jesus mean by that? See, Peter in is in is a word in Greek. Okay. The word Cephas is in Aramic. The word Peter or Cephas actually means a rock. A rock. Para. So Jesus is saying, you are Simon now. One, I, once I am working in you, once I am through working in you, you will become Cephas. That is one of the greatest encouragements of the word of God. He is telling each of his followers today, you are so and so. Today you are this. Today you are a wreck. Today you are an unbeliever. Today you are a blasphemer. Today you are an adulterer. Today you are a pornographer. Today you are a liar. Today you are a cheat. But once I am through with you, you will be the child of God. You will be the child of God. You know? He gives us the power to become. Turn with me to John chapter 1 and verse 12. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. He gave them the right to become, the power to become, the right to become. See? Simon was his name, but he had the power to be, he had the right to become Cephas, the right to become Peter. When God has called us, we know where we were, we know where we are. But the encouragement is, you will be. You will be. When God starts his work in you, and God finishes his work in you, you will be somebody else. You will be the child of God. You will be the child of God. He gives us the power to be. Okay. As I'm ending this, I just want to remind you. Andrew and uh, John came to Jesus because of John the Baptist's testimony. Because he witnessed and he said, Behold the Lamb. That's how Andrew connected with Jesus. Andrew's life, John the Baptist's life, Jesus' life. One life connected to another life, connected to Jesus' life. So, three stories. Andrew's story became Jesus' story. How? Through John the Baptist's story. Okay, So, that was a beautiful connection how Jesus got Andrew. But then Andrew did not have to preach. He just had to go and invite his brother Peter. And Peter came and connected his life to Jesus' life. See? Maybe James was brought in by John because John had also spent time with Jesus. But later on we'll find Philip was directly evangelized by Jesus. Nathaniel was directly influenced by Jesus. See? It doesn't matter which is the way that people connect their lives to Jesus as long as they connect to Jesus. Jesus uses various ways and various people to reach out to our lives and bring us into a relationship with Him. You know? So each experience is different. But praise God that He is connecting us, connecting us to Himself. We were far away from him. He used some many means. People from different backgrounds. People from different languages. People from different groups and different churches and different Sunday schools and different teachers and everyone God used to bring you into a relationship with him. And he's going to do the same with us. He's going to use us to reach out to those people who are outside there and to bring them, to connect their lives to his life. John the Baptist. Andrew, Peter, John, your life, my life. Every life has to be connected with Jesus. And God can use us as his instruments. Variety of means, variety of people, all bringing us to Jesus. Let us look to him and let's say, Lord, you have started your work in us. Today we are this, but you are not finished with me. You are transforming me into somebody else. Let's thank God for that. Heavenly Father, we acknowledge that through many people you reached out to us. 
through their witnessing, to their proclaiming of the gospel, we came to know who you are. And you brought us into a relationship with you. And when we came into a relationship with you, you spelled out our names. Ordinary names. People with a lot of sin. People with a lot of failures. People who are pathetic. But God has a plan to transform us from the inside out into people who are extraordinary. And you will accomplish it in your time. Help us to be instruments, useful in the hands of the Lord, just like how John the Baptist was. Help us to realize, O oh Lord, that each one of us is extraordinary because God has spoken to our hearts. But each of us are also human. There are many things that we don't know, yet you are going to use us as your instruments. We are not the message. We are only the messengers. Help us to faithfully proclaim the message of Jesus Christ to others, O oh Lord Father. And help us to be effective in God's hands. But teach us to remain humble. We are not great. But our God is great. We thank you and we praise you for the message that has spoken to our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. We'll sing, Amen, brother. We'll sing this song and we'll close. Praises for my 